what I could do that would be impactful and not just make money. You know, it's actually about purpose and about enjoying your day to day. And then there are people that wake up from the matrix and, and want to go back into the matrix, right? Because there is, there is something quite painful about knowing the truth. So, well, for me, you're talking about work-life balance. If you ask me what day of the week it is right now, I could tell you. Surely you become dependent on someone bringing you food instead of going out hunting. Fear, in fact, is, a, is an asset, quite a comfortable life. And then my father suddenly died of a heart attack. And he died in front of me uh, of a heart attack. Inspiration Nation, hello. Welcome to another week on the podcast. I'm really, really excited um, to have a, another guest. And you know where to find us in the usual places. It's at listen to Ian on Twitter and on Instagram. And you'll find me, just type in Jose or Inspiration Nation in your Google machine and it will come up with me. So again, we drop another special on you guys and I'm really excited, as I said, to have another guest. I've got this man on this podcast because I love his, his, love his message. He's done a lot of great things and he's got a great purposeful mission. I just want to tell you a little bit about him before he comes on. His name's Simon Squibb, you see him right there next to me. He owned and sold a multi-million pound media agency called Fluid, and he re retired at 40. He's now set up on his own with a, with a lovely team where he's helping people set up purposeful businesses. You know, he's doing this for free. Um, he's absolutely genuine in his intent and he's actually you know i reached out to him uh, we met over tiktok and he's a very genuine guy and as i say we're we're meeting here we've just really sort of met over the last month i just want to tell you about his background because this is what inspired me really to reach out he was bullied at school he left home at 15 with no more than five pounds in his pocket and started his first business at 17. Um, he's owned and invested in many businesses i think it may be around, is it about 60 business I think you've invested in? And it's just incredible. Um, and he also suffers in dyslexia and thinking about all these challenges. That's why I'm introducing you to who I think is very inspirational, Simon Scribb. So welcome, Simon. Welcome to Inspiration Nation podcast. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good. Thank you so much for having me on the show. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you too. And uh, I know you run your own podcast as well which is the Good Luck Podcast, which is, you know, I've listened to a few of those, which is fantastic. And um, I was going to like, just kick off really. Um, so you could, you, you could have retired, you could have retired at 40. So, so why, so why coming, why, why now? What, what's, what's happened? You know, what, what happened for you? Why now come in and help people do this? Yeah, there's, there's, I guess there's two questions there. I think the retirement piece is, is an interesting thing on its own. I mean, I think retirement is a funny word. Um, I, I, I basically look at retirement as being able to do whatever you want to do, in my view, without the need to worry about a financial gain. And to me, um, you know, some people, when they get to that point, they just play golf all day. Um, and and that, that's fine. Um, and some people wait until they're 65 when, when to, to do that. But my, my view is that when you get to a point where you can sustain yourself and your family and you can give back, you should. So that, that age for me what was... 40 and I always tell people that um, you know I left school at 15 I was kicked out of home at 15 years old and then by 40 I'm retired and of course it's the bit in the middle that's really interesting um, and for me uh, the whole retirement piece was was really more about uh, taking some time out initially to figure out who I was today what I wanted and not be addicted to power money and, and all those things and think about you know, what I wanted to do next and figure out what I could do that would be impactful and not just make money um, and, think, and think about that. But also, I guess, um, you know, why now? In part because of what's happening with the coronavirus impact on the world. I feel like my mission, as you know, because you've researched me, but my mission these days is to help one million people start a business of their own and make sure no entrepreneur feels alone doing it. And I guess there's two reasons why. One is, I think that that is one way out of our economic problem that we've all, all, we're facing right now because of coronavirus. I feel like if you can't get a job coming out of university, for example, like you were expecting, like you were promised, perhaps the answer is you create a job for yourself. Um, now that business doesn't have to be Facebook. It doesn't have to be 
TikTok, it could just be a business that you love. And so, you know, I feel like now is the time for entrepreneurship to be a solution for a lot of people that aren't going to get the job they want. But equally, I feel like um, if we get it right, it can also lead to a more satisfactory life for people. Because I feel like a lot of people have been sold the treadmill, you know, the system of, you know, get a job, get a mortgage. Um, and then, you know, 60, uh, when you're 65, you can retire and finally have time for yourself. And, I, and, I, and my argument is, well, why wait till you're 65? Why not enjoy your day-to-day -day right now? So uh, for me, that, that, um, that, that, that has come through entrepreneurship. And I feel like it's great to give back what I've learned being an entrepreneur to the next generation. So that's what's motivating me. And retirement is a funny word. I don't really feel like I'm, I'm traditionally retired. It's not, I'm not not working. So I don't have to work if I don't, have to, if I don't want to. And I don't have to um, charge people to get my help. I, I can help people because I've got the talent to do so. And I can help anybody because I don't need to think about um, how charging them before I help them. So that means I can help anybody in any part of society. Um, someone that's unemployed and hasn't got the money to get a consultant or support, I will help them. Equally, of course, if someone's got a, a big business and, it's, and it can grow and hire more people and make the economy better and make the world a better, I will also help them and not charge them. So it, that, that, that's what retirement means to me. And why now? Well, I just think now is the time for entrepreneurship really to go mainstream. And I don't think entrepreneurship is uh, this, it's this thing that's made out to be. It's not something that you're born with. I think we're not born doctors. We're not born lawyers. Um, I think it's something you can be trained to be. Um, and, and, and so I want to uh, demystify entrepreneurship and I want to give that, frankly, that freedom that entrepreneurship brings to, to, to people out there that want it. I think it's such a lovely thing. I think that's again, you know, because I know on TikTok, you said, like, I'm going to give my earnings away to someone who, you know, you sort of run this thing where you look, if you, if you give me a great idea, I'm going to give them away. And I think it's so lovely to hear that because so many, so much now, you know, people that, you know, people are, you know, there, there's always, you've got to pay something or whatever. And I think, and I loved your all thing where I heard about, you said, you know, is there value in free? Is there value in free? And I, I absolutely believe there's value in free. It's, I, I absolutely believe that. And I think that's what you're, you're delivering totally, you know, in so much. And it's, and it's really interesting to say that, you know, you could play golf all day, right? You could, you could just go out now. You could just, you could just shut this all down now and go off and live the rest of your life. But it's so nice to hear that you're going off and you're going to try and, you know, help and you know, help people for free. And of course, yeah, you'd invest. And I imagine there'd be some sort of deal where you say, you know, as it grows and we, we do something together, which I think is great. And I think, and I think a question to you is really, why do you think people are buying so much into the, and I've done it, I, I'm doing it, right? <laughs> I've got this on the side that I'm doing. You're actually, you've, like in the same time frame, if we think about it, you know, I've, I've worked from a young age, from 18 to now, and I've gone onto that trip. So I know what it's like, like you know, and, and I'm really lucky because I'm working for this, I do enjoy, but there is that other thing. So why do you think people have, you know, why do you think people have now have, are, are into that? And they, and they find it difficult to break into entrepreneurship? Or do you think maybe people think entrepreneurship is scary? What, what are your thoughts? Why do you think people are still stuck on that trip and are not sort of branching out? What, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's a combination of reasons. I think people are often, um, you know, lazy. And I, I'm lazy, for the, for the record. But I think what happens is that if you've got a, um, you know, if you've got a steady income, um, then people, you know, they can get settled and, and take it easy. And then once people get mortgage payments and all these other fixed monthly costs, their life revolves around the month. So they need that monthly income. And so uh, it, it really is just about habit and addiction. And, and so for me, I, I always think about it in the context of like, you know, it's actually about purpose and about enjoying your day to day. But so many people get lost along the way where they end up. And you're lucky that you enjoy what you do, but a lot of people don't like what they do. Yes. Right. But they're, 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 as they get older, they get more debt, they get a bigger house, they get a nicer car, they want more holidays, they get used to a more comfortable life. And it gets harder and harder, I think, for them to give that up and go and build something of purpose uh, where they perhaps don't have any income for a while. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, for me, it's, it's about really waking people up from the matrix is sometimes how I explain it. Absolutely it, love it, that. It, and then there are people that wake up from the matrix and, and want to go back into the matrix, right? Because there is, there is something quite painful about knowing the truth um, about how the world works and how the 1% succeed and how, 
you know, you are the battery in the system if you're not careful. But, but sometimes it's easier to be a battery in the system that, you know, managing people, managing payroll, managing cash flow, um, having the, the whole picture in your mind, it, it, can, be, it can be quite painful for people. Um, but I, I personally think there's no better way to live once you've got through the pain you understand that this is the real world, this is the real opportunity, this is unlimited upside, and frankly, limited downside. Whereas when you're um, working for someone else, you know, I always describe it at the beginning when you work for someone else, it's really easy because they give you everything. Here's the company, here's the job role, here's the laptop, and, and away you go. And at first, you, people enjoy it. And then slowly, I think, as your management change, uh, and then they change philosophy in the company, and then the company has highs and lows, and people you like leave, and people you don't like or join, slowly but surely you begin to hate the job most people and so i think entrepreneurship um is exactly the opposite it's really painful at the beginning no one gives you a laptop no one gives you clear direction and it's really hard but as time goes on and you're in control of what happens day to day two three four five years from now if you're still in business it's an amazing feeling but a lot of people just can't push through um that mental barrier but i think it's also because of education I think the education system we all know was designed really to make factory workers go work in the Ford factory plant and be able to afford to buy a Ford car. So a lot of the time, you know, you're given just enough to be dangerous, but you're not given enough to be a good chef. You know, you're not, you're not completely woken up. For example, you're not taught about purpose. You're not, you're not taught about meaning. You're not, you're not taught about these things that I think are actually important, like moral code. You're, you're really given a, you know, a risk assessment of, Here's the entrepreneur world. If you're lucky, that's talked about briefly. Oh my God, don't do that. And then generally it's, oh, but, you know, um, here's a job for you. You know, you could be an accountant. That's safe. And, and that's what you should do. And, and so that, that, that part of it, I think. I love that, Simon, about the matrix. Um, and that people are sort of used to that thing, sort of like your mum and dad have gone to get a job and it's like passed down through the, through the sort of generations where this is this whole thing that's happened. And, and sort of to, so I, that's, you know, it's really resonated with me actually, because, you know, I've, 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 you know, I've been in that, I'm in that, you know, I'm doing that. Um, but I've been lucky enough to, well, I only lost a few, like only lost probably seven or eight years really where I've really started to shape where I want to be. But it's a lot harder, like you say, within a business to shape where you want to be. So I've, I've actually got, like you say, I think you're right. Like you are at the mercy of businesses because I've been, well, I have, I have been up for redundancy twice in my entire life. I've got married done once. And you're not in control of that. Like, you, you know, to a certain extent, you can apply for your job, but you don't know whether it's going to happen. And one I survived and one I didn't. And that's because of uncertainty. So I do get what you're saying. Um, and so, you know, people leave, you know, management changes. And, and, and I mean, I'm very fortunate because where I'm eating is great. Um, but as I say, I've got this that I'm doing here, like, like you. So I'm stretching out a little bit, right? I'm trying to bit by bit, building this for the last, you know, two years. I've been doing this now really solidly. It is hard, right? Because at the minute, no income. You're just like doing this because I've got a purpose, and and that's what I really think. So I want to, you know, inspire people. And I think that's what that's what you're speaking about because you're not. You just because I know when, but well, I just tell a little story where, um, when I was playing a band, I played in a band, and people on the on the podcast will know. And I remember my mother-in-law saying, "You want to go and get? You should really go and get a proper job." There's a whole sort of thing about, oh, I'd better go and get a job, and that's how it all started. I started, oh, I've got, a, I've got, like you said, I've got a. Uh, you know, I had a girlfriend, we got married, and then you go on to that and you go on to that. And I say it's not that more of that, but I go, but I think, but I did tell you earlier that I just suffer with depression, and I thought I've got to find meaning, and that really, that whole thing about what am I doing? I woke up, that that's what you were saying, and ever since then, I've always had this bug about coaching and inspiring people. And this is what that's that what you just said has really spoken to me. Um, and that was the thing that I needed to add that I needed to add some. So, you know, really thank you for that because it is like waking up and it is difficult. And over the last 10 years trying to do this thing, it's like I'm on and then I'm off and then I'm on and then I'm off. And then I've lost who's been really consistent, but it's like, you really have to put a lot of effort and there's no much return, but you do it because you love it. That is the thing, isn't it? And you do it because you love it. And when you love it, it just doesn't feel like work. Um, and I think that is the thing. And, and the thing you said as well, Simon, about people hating their jobs I hear this a lot because people say, I can't wait to my payday. When's payday? And they're like wishing their lives away. What are your thoughts on that? Because, you know, they're going through their lives and they're all and talk about Friday and things like that. Oh, it's Friday. 
I hear a lot of that. What are your thoughts on that? Because that for me, I don't know for you, but for me, like people are almost like wishing their lives away. So, well, for me, you're talking about work-life balance issue there. So, you know, again, um, my view is, I mean, I never, if you ask me what day of the week it is right now, I couldn't tell you. I, I, I never construct things in a seven day cycle. I, I construct them in what has to happen tomorrow um, and what, you know, what's my plan generally. And, you know, I do things, I have, there's no such thing as work-life balance. There's just life. And so I think that's, that's another lesson. I think it's something when people first become entrepreneurs, they fight quite hard to manage because suddenly you're thinking all the time about the business. And that's why, again, why a lot of people in the first year can't handle it. But I think, you know, if you realize that you are actually, your work is your life and your life is your work and work is a funny word anyway. I mean, what is work? Work, people say to me when I, you know, before having a child, they're like, oh, when you have a child, it's a lot of work. <laughs> As if it's a thing, you know, like... <laughs> Work out, going to the gym. It's almost like, oh, I've got to work out. You know, like, it's like, you know what? I'm lucky enough I can go and work out. I'm lucky enough I've got kids, you know, who love me and I love them, you know, like, and I feel that about uh, what you do every day. And, and I think sometimes people get caught in the grind and then they can't wait till Friday because they don't have a bigger mission. And they constructed the matrix around themselves, which makes them believe that everything is in a seven day cycle. Um, and those two days, whenever they are, whether it's Saturday and Sunday or Monday and Tuesday, if you work in the hotel industry, a lot of people mm. have, you know, different times off. They, they still, you know, constructed it around this fake reality. And, and that's what I think brings them, brings them misery, you know, because ultimately they have this incredible high where they think they're free for one evening, Friday night and Saturday. Um, and, and then they're, you know, back on Sunday, they're worried they're back to work Monday. And, and they've constructed a prison for themselves. Um, that, that's my view on it. Um, and you know, I know, I know uh, it's a little bit controversial, but you know, for me, it, it's really about you know there is no such thing as work-life balance, and stop trying to make it happen that way. Um, so that that's my take on the Friday uh, and weekend point you make. Um, I would just add though, I, I, I sometimes look at the way waking up bit that we're talking about, and the way I try to explain it to people in, in a different way is when you travel most people in england have been lucky enough to have some experience of traveling overseas and when you realize when you go experience spain or you go and experience you know asia for example you kind of realize how big the world is and how exciting it is i've lived overseas and what's amazing about that is you you really learn about culture you learn about another dimension almost literally like a whole new universe i lived in hong kong for a long time it's like living in a, a, a an altered alternate reality it's just mind-blowingly interesting and then you come back to England changed you come back more awake and so I think a lot of people can relate to that experience have gone somewhere on holiday go that's amazing shall we move there and then they go back to England and maybe they do maybe they don't but they've, they've had that awakening thing I think that's what it's like when you go and build a business that you love or you work every day in something you love you, you wake up in the same way um, and so most people have that traveling experience I try to explain it that way but not everyone's had the build your own business experience they find it a little harder to relate to it but anyway that's my quick take on it i really like that i think i think it's a really good thing and i think like i say and i can always like i'm sort of half in and half out of that and actually when i'm doing this stuff and talking to you i feel this is it this is what i feel that's, that speaks to me but like having these types of conversations and and actually doing the videos and helping people and having those conversations it does speak to me and i think that's that is it. I think it's finding your purpose. Um, yeah, I love that. I absolutely love that. Um, so I sort of talk about a little bit around, you know, about you left home and I suppose it was a really difficult time. So tell me about how, how is that, um, home life and when you got kicked out of home, how, how was that and how do you think it fed into you becoming an entrepreneur? Did it, did it spur you? What was, what happened there? And, are you, are you able to sort of give, shed a little bit of light on that? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it, it's, it's a story. I've done a, a TEDx talk on this. Um, and, you know, ba basically, I, you know, at 15 years old, I had kind of a, a junction. I, I, up to the age of 15, I, I lived quite a comfortable life, really. I mean, I had, I had some bullying issues when I was young. But, you know, generally, I feel like I had quite a comfortable life. And then my father suddenly died of a heart attack. And he died in front of me uh, of a heart attack. And I think, um, you know, as that was happening in front of me, I, you know, and then, and then he, he was suddenly gone. And I think 
had kind of a strange way of processing what had happened. And I, I guess you reflect on how in, at 56, I'm 15 years old, my dad's died, he's 56. How has this happened? You know, what, why has he died of a heart attack? And part of what I processed was um, he started being self-employed quite late in life. And I can remember as a youngster him telling me, you know, oh, um, you know, I, I started, you know, this business because my previous company I'd worked for for 15 years just suddenly let me go. And so, you know, I started this business and, and starting a business for him in later in his life was very stressful because he had four children. I was one of those four. I had a, a very difficult uh, person to manage, my mother, who is, right. you know, still alive today, a difficult person still today. Right. Um, and, and, you know, he, he had a lot of pressures on him, I think, to, to perform. And so, uh, you know, I think it killed him. Uh, I, think, right. I think it was too much. Wow. And so I took away at that moment that, you know, I, I didn't want to follow his path. I wanted to learn from what I could gather data point wise from his life and had this epiphany that, you know, a big mistake that he'd made was really becoming self-employed too late in life. Because he liked being self-employed, but it was incredibly high pressure. And I think he neglected his health um, and he, you know, he had to feed us. He had to pay a big mortgage. He had lots, we had lots of properties as well. There's a whole other story, but, um, but there was, you know, there was a lot of pressure on him to, to, to perform. And I think it killed him. And I think that that moment I had this sudden from, I'm going to be a lawyer, go to Cambridge university, all these things that in my mind were my next steps to like, you know what? I'm just going to start my own thing. I'm just going to, you know, I'm not going to wait until I'm 45 or 40 to start my own business because someone else has decided they're going to fire me. I'm just going to start. Yeah. And so, you know, I had that conversation with my mother who, um, you know, we, we had falling out basically over that and a few other things. Right. Um, and, and at that point, my mum said, well, it's my rules will get out. And I'm like, okay, I'll get out. So at that point wow. I left school, kicked out of home. And, and it was actually the best thing that ever happened to me. I often say my father kind of gave me a gift. Um, and, and that gift was suddenly freedom. And, you know, although initially it sounds like it was a hard life, suddenly, there was also something magical in the toughness of it all. So suddenly I was in a, I, I rented a shitty little room in a shitty house and, and, um, and, and suddenly had to pay rent. And that, that um, need to pay rent and feed yourself generated something in my brain. It woke up my entrepreneurial muscle and I suddenly uh, had to make money. And, and so, you know, within a week of living in this rented accommodation, I got the note to pay the rent and I had to make money. And I thought, what should I do? And then I was walking down the street and there was this big house, um, not too far from where I'd rented this room with, uh, with this very messy garden. And my brain just said, that's a big house. Um, they must have money and that garden's a mess. Why? Why don't I just offer to uh, take care of the garden and they pay me? Maybe they, you know, my instinct was just there. And I knocked on the door and I was right. The person answered and said, I haven't got time to take care of the garden. You know, I've been trying to, I've been thinking about hiring a gardener and it's great that you knocked on the door and yeah, okay, how much do you charge? And next thing you know, I, I realized there was a market. That same day I knocked on about 80 doors. I managed to convince 11 people to give me their gardening work. Um, wow. and, and away I was. The next day I realized, hold on, I don't actually have any equipment or any money to buy the equipment. So I had the brainwave to go back to the 11 people that had said yes with a shitty contract. Uh, that said what I was going to do and asked them to 50% deposit and they gave it to me cash. Wow. Now, I don't have a register, I don't have a brochure. There's no such thing as a website at this point. I'm 15 years old. I probably look it, but they gave me the money. And then I took that money and went and bought the equipment. And a week later I was a gardening company and I was wow. doing gardens. I realized that I am not equipped or talented at gardening. So then I had to hire people to help me do it mainly because I didn't have the talent or the ability to do it on my own. So next thing you know, I'm a guard. Two weeks later, I'm a gardening company who's hiring people. Wow, wow. So you know, it, um, it really is a, a funny how I think you know life is. Uh, you know, you have junctions, and I think you can either decide that this is an opportunity in front of you, or and and go for it and embrace the the changes you're going through and enjoy it, or you can you can look at it. You know, list of bad things that have happened to you. And assume that you know that that's the reason that I mean I, I remember um, there was a moment um, when you know I, I had someone in the house I was renting a room in it was pretty 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 dire place I was I was renting a room in 
someone said to me, you know what, you're so young, you could easily get social money. You just go to the social office, sign a document, and uh, the social services will give you money straight away because you're in that vulnerable category. And, you know, I, I think it was big money, you know, at the time, like 350 pounds a week I could get by doing nothing, just going to the um, government office and signing this document. And, I, and I, I don't know what it was, but I absolutely kind of felt repelled by that idea. Um, although there was an instinct in me also that I could just play Sega Mega Drive, which was the popular console at that time, all day long and, and get for pounds a week. But, but, you know, that, that, if I'd done that, I know what happens. You, you know, you get trapped in a system. It's a different type of system to a job, but it's a similar, similar system. You become addicted to that system. You don't get a chance to enhance your skills. And, and slowly but surely, you become dependent on someone bringing you food instead of going out and hunting. And we are built for hunting, you know? And so I absolutely um, say thank you to my father uh, often for giving me this gift and a chance to go out there and find out who I was and, and realize I was an entrepreneur, learn entrepreneurship, and then um, realize what a wonderful thing it is, have the skills to then go back to the 15 year old me today and help them. I mean, you just you just just jumped into it, didn't you? And I know you said about your dad, and that was it's such a hard thing for it to actually happen in front of you. But and 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 what what that speaks to me is that you just seem to have just you just have that mind of okay, this is what I, you know. You felt that just getting that check wasn't something you wanted to do, and that mm -hmm. that do you think it's do you think it's maybe people have to develop a self awareness piece? Do you think that that event gave you almost like a switch self awareness to to do something different. Had that not happened, do you think things might have been different? To be honest with you, I'm not sure I was self-aware at that point. Um, I, I think at that point, what happened, it was more like um, survival. You know, I actually didn't eat for three days. Wow. That wow. You yeah, know, that's understandable. You don't eat. Um, you know, I managed to get accommodation because I said I paid the rent at the end of the week and, 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 and in this particular hobble that I lived in, they didn't take deposit. So I was able to actually get somewhere to sleep, um, although um, I did have a homeless moment. But, but the point is that, uh, you know, I, I think the whole, um, let, let's call it, I, I, like if you unplug from the matrix and you've never used your arms before, you know, and you are suddenly outside the matrix, you've got to learn to use those arms, right? You know, if anyone hasn't watched the movie, they might be getting lost now. You've got to go watch the movie. <laughs> go watch it. It's great. Like, before you can become self-aware, I think you've got to learn to use your, your, your brain to its full capacity to wake up the parts of the brain that are even aware of self-awareness. Because a lot of people will say they're self-aware. They won't know that they're, they're not. A lot of people don't know what they don't know. You know, it's a bit like when I say to people, China, they instantly have a perception of China. They'll say communism, bad, or so whatever they've got to say, right? Until you've gone there, you don't know the truth. And that's kind of what it's like. You don't wake up until you see it. So when I'm suddenly presented with no choice but to make a living, you wake up in the context of you learn to hustle. But that doesn't, I wasn't self-aware at that point. In fact, at that point, I think it was more like an instinct. I've got to get meat, you know, like I've got to go and hunt. How am I going to catch an animal and eat it you know that was it was more that it wasn't self-aware it was it was a bit later i think that, that self-awareness kicked in and i think a combination of um, maturing as a as a business person having some limited success which allowed me to uh breathe allowed me to say okay it's not just about hunting anymore it's about developing fire it's about learning to build houses it's learning to work with your community it's not just go out and eat food Sort of grab food and eat it. I think I became self-aware when I had a bit of breathing room, which was around 21, 22, when I, when I finally kind of made it and I wasn't every day just hunting, um, that I was able to have a bit more self-awareness. Well, wow, that's incredible. Um, there's a lot of things in there, um, you know, around entrepreneurs. And it seems to be, a, I don't know, you know, because I mean, I, I've watched a bit of entrepreneurs and how they started, like, You've got um, people like, um, I think Mark, Mark Cuban, I think he was the one he started doing, I think one of his first things was like cutting lawns. When you look at the first pictures of Jeff Bezos, you know, in his, with his desk and he's got nothing there and he's just launching, um, there seems to be a common thread that, you know, there seems to be this survival thing that seems to run through entrepreneurship um, and that you just found that you had to find a way um, and because you had to eat. So do you think a lot of this comes out a little bit of, 
desperation that there's this it's almost like that is the only way you're going to get that you could have had the check of course but you didn't really think that it seems like you just said no this is i've just got to survive and that kicked off the whole journey for you would you say that's what would you say it's almost like a desperation i've got to go get food or i've got to earn this to get food what what would you say to that well i mean it, it's um you know one of the traits I, I i have this thing that i've actually been very lucky in life right i've actually had a lot of lucky breaks i wouldn't be successful today and i wouldn't have been able to retire if i hadn't had some luck okay so let, let's just put that on the table because you know i'm not I'm not smarter than you. <laughs> I, I'm, 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 I would say I'm average. And, and so I think, but there is a couple of ways, uh, why there are three elements that make you luckier in life, right? And, and one of the key elements is definitely persistence. And persistence is much easier when you've got no choice. So, so I, you know, I think there's a hundred studies out there. You know, I've heard this a million times, but you'll, you'll notice a lot of people that are successful, what happens at the beginning of their career is in a way they've got no choice. So at 15 years old, no one was going to give me a job because I didn't even have a national insurance card. Right? I, could, I couldn't actually legally, technically get a job. I didn't have that national insurance yeah. card, which you don't get till you're 16. That's right, yeah. So, again, um, you know, I, I, I did have an instinct not to take the social money because... I, I, I just didn't feel like that, that didn't feel right to me. That there was just, I didn't feel like getting free money. It, I'd never been given free money my whole life and I give my parents credit for that. They never just gave me money. And so there was always, I had to earn it, even if it was tidy up my room when I was seven, you know, like there was always an element of that, which I think was great. So something about free money didn't feel right. And to be honest, I like the gamification of entrepreneurship. I like the process of building something. I loved it. Having an idea and then making it real. Being in your head as something you know can happen and then bringing it into the world and making it real. That is a game that I, I enjoyed. And I think that, um, you know, but back to your question, I, th I think there is, I don't know if it's desperation, but I think it's more like a combination of um, no choice. So you could, I don't know if that's desperation. That, that's sometimes just like, I see people, for example, they'll post up, I'm going to get fit. I'm overweight. And now they're kind of committed to it. They've kind of told people. That's why people do that quite often too. And once you're committed and people are asking you about it, you feel like you have, you keeps you on the straight and narrow a little yes. bit, more, right? It's not necessarily desperation. Yeah, yeah. It's a form of motivation in my mind. So, so I think it, yeah, definitely, um, you know, having to eat is a motivator. But again, I know a lot <laughs> yes. of people say, that motivation will make them go down the, the easier route, which is, you know, put a hand out, give me money, um, or, or um, you know, enter the social system that's there to help the most vulnerable. Um, but, I, but I feel like, you know, it can also drive you, I think, to discover who you are, dig deep, and, and learn the skills that you were meant to learn. Because I think there is something that's all, that naturally we're all meant to be doing, but the, the present world has, has, has been a bit distorted by, by, by um, capitalism and, and by you know, motivations that aren't quite right, like someone's Instagram feed being better than mine. And that has created a weird dynamic where sometimes people are chasing things that they've been sold or what they want, but they're not actually what they're meant to be chasing. Right? Yeah, I think that's the whole thing about, you know, in, you know, I mean, I, I mentioned to you, I know, when you sort of met about Evan Carmichael and he's another guy, he's a Canadian guy, really lovely guy, um, that money's not more than number one. It's that purpose and meaning piece. You know, and, and that's, I think, a big, big part of that. And there's, there's you know, I'm not a millionaire, right? Simon is, right? What makes you happy then? Well, I mean, I would say um, money does not make you happy unless you're already happy. Equally, money will make you more unhappy if you're already unhappy. So, so to, to me, you've got to be happy, whatever. I, first of all, I think that's a strange state anyway. No one's happy all the time. I don't care who you are. But I think you've got to be, I think you've got to have a purpose. You've got to feel that you're doing the right thing for you at this stage in your life, whatever that may be. Be it you should be spending time with your family or you should be working on your health or you should be working on your career. Whatever element you feel is important to you, you should be focusing in on that. And I think that, you know, for me, um, I am happy because... I was already happy before I had, before I had money. And all, all money does is buy you time, in my view. People that spend it on possessions are completely missing the point of what money is about. Right? For me, money only buys you time. And if it buys you time to can do more of what was already making you happy, like 
I love spending time with my wife. I love spending time with my son. I like exercising. I like helping people build businesses. I like helping people wake up like I did. So if I can, I have money to do those things, I'm happy. But if tomorrow I didn't have any money, most of those things I could still do. You know, so yeah. it, money just allows me to do those things more, right? Yes. So, you know, it allows me to buy all the equipment to broadcast professionally so that millions of people potentially could hear what I've got to say. Money allows me to do that. But if I didn't have that money, I'd be talking to people one-on-one -on -one and still doing it as I was when I didn't have as much money. Yeah, it's a great answer. And I think, you know, because people talk, you know, you know, you sort of, I do a bit of research and stuff like that. And they're, and uh, the opinion people say that they're, uh, they're uh, very unhappy millionaires because they haven't got any meaning behind what they've done. They've got all this stuff, but it, there's that need, need fulfillment as a human being to feel that you're doing things that are purposeful. And that's exactly what, you know, that's what spoke to me about what you do. Um, luck, it's a skill. You talked about this. And I want to dig a little bit more into that. So you think, you can just you said you have been very lucky in your life but there must have been a point where you must have positioned something to get lucky can you just tell me a little bit more about why you think luck is a skill and you know how can people get better at being lucky i suppose is what i'm going to ask you how can i how can people tell our audience how they could be better at getting lucky what, what do you think is needed yeah well i'm i would just plug that i have a book coming out called luck is a skill um, and so everyone buy it all the proceeds will go back into helping people start businesses of their own so um but the the uh, the, the whole premise is 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 basically i mean there are the, the dictionary itself needs an update when it comes to the word luck because i i actually think there's two types of definitions uh, one is the random luck and let's call it where you're born you know there are things that you have no control over that are just part of what happens to you so so coronavirus would be another good example. You know, like it's no one's fault. It is what it is. And it's unlucky for us all. But I think that, um, I think there's another type of luck. And I think that luck can be managed. And it still has an element of randomness to it, but I think it can be influenced, right? So, you know, if, if I said to you, oh, you got lucky, it can be almost offensive. It's like, no, no, I, I worked hard. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, you what are you talking about you can't you know you can't say i was lucky you know i um it's almost an insult right but yeah, the yeah. truth is anyone who's been exceedingly successful there is definitely you can pinpoint and i've, I've done this in my own podcast show pretty much every single person i've interviewed i interviewed the world's most successful entrepreneurs and i can tell you right now every single one of them has a story where if, if this lucky moment hadn't happened they wouldn't be successful right so so the, the formula that I basically figured out is that there's, there's, there's three elements. One I mentioned earlier about persistence. You know, in, in sales, you know, the people always, the average amount of time someone will bother someone else to sell them something before they'll give up is three times, okay. right, on average, right? So that, that, that's a big mistake. That's why a lot of salespeople fail. You know, I, I remember when I started my agency business, we made a list of 50 companies we wanted to work with. And I, start, I contacted them from day one when we started. It took me eight years to sign up some of those clients. I can remember thinking, I've, I started talking to you eight years ago, so I remember in particular, you know, eight years to get one of those clients, right? And I must have bothered them every single month somehow, whether it was you know, an easy newsletter or sending them a brochure or sending them a Christmas gift or wishing them a happy birthday or you know, whatever it was. You know, I always had a hello. It wasn't bye, bye, bye. But it was, it was a connection. And I think that you know, persistence is key, right? That kind of follow through. But there are two other, other pieces to it, which I have discovered. One is risk. If you do not take risk, you reduce your chances of luck. Now, of course, if you go buy a lottery ticket and you risk that pound, you can get lucky and win the lottery, but the odds are much lower, right? If you take a one risk with one pound one time, right? But You've taken a risk. You think about that model and you times it by a million, right? If you are taking risk every day, you will increase your chances of being successful. If you do not take risk, you will reduce your chances of being successful. Risk for people links to fear. And people have misunderstood the instinct of fear. People think fear is something to be fearful of. They think fear is a bad thing. So when someone says something to you, like I remember when I was 20, someone said to me, hey, Simon, 
um, why don't you come and talk? You know, we've got 2,000 people at this event and you should come and talk <laughs> about your, your journey. I remember having fear, right? My, <laughs> yeah, arms sweat. And I, my instinct was to say, I don't, I, I, don't I, I can't do it. You know, I'm, I'm not a public speaker and I don't want to do it. But I always went the other way when I, when I had this feeling. I leaned into it and I said, yes, I'm grateful that I did because it was a transformational thing for me. But the point I'm making here is that fear, in fact, is, a, is an asset. That instinct of fear, if you think back to its original purpose, it was designed to give us a boost at a time of difficulty. So if a lion's coming towards us, and we have to think about how to survive, fear kicks in and we go and we win and we survive. So it's not something to switch off as soon as you feel it. It's something to turn on, turn up if you can. I lean into fear. I love fear. I still feel it, but every time I feel it, I feel like actually it's telling me I'm doing something right. I don't feel it in as much as I used to because my risk tolerance and my <laughs> yeah. fear tolerance have increased. Yeah, yeah. But an asset, not a negative. People totally misunderstood what fear is, right? Fear is an asset. When you feel it, you should lean into it. And without risk, you won't be lucky. Facts. So risk and persistence. And then the final thing that, that will, if you employ it and deploy it in your life, you will be luckier. You will increase your chances of being lucky. And luck is the key to success. And the third thing you need is a clear understanding of your destination. Now, a lot of people, when it comes to destination, they, I will say to them, okay, what do you want to achieve? They will say, I want to make 15 million pounds, 20 million pounds. That, that's my destination. They've misunderstood that is not the destination, that is fuel for the car. Where is the car going? Right? So, so basically, um, yeah, if you understand your destination, if you understand where you're trying to get to as a person, as a business, you will increase your chances of luck because in a way you want to get mystical about it, you're asking the universe for something, right? And if you ask the universe correctly for what you want, it will deliver it because you'll be looking for it, you'll be asking for it, you'll be searching for it, you'll be working towards it. It's more likely to happen. Love that. So you employ those three things and you will be luckier in life. I love that, I love that because in fact, when I wanted to come and ask you whether you're coming to this podcast, I was feeling fear. <laughs> I was thinking, mm -hmm. is he gonna say yes? I don't know. Um, you know, because it, it's, it's one of those things that I've, you know, I've, I've actually, you know, I've actually had to learn that to, to, to reach out to people, um, to post a video, right? I feel fearful that like I'm going to post, a, I have to post a video, every, I post a video every day. That was a one minute video every day. And I was thinking, if I want to, if I want to go out there and help people and, you know, coach people and inspire people, then I've got to be leaning into that. And so I've done that. And the thing is, it's that these, all these one minute videos have led to this moment, me asking you to come on a podcast. And I felt fear that you might say no, you know, and, and I think you're absolutely right. And I think, when you lean into it, it is, I think it is a signal. And I think it's such a great thing that you said that because yeah, you know, I felt that. And I think even more so, I'm going to do leaning into it even more, I think, in that way. Um, so what do you fear then? Because you said your risk tolerance is really high. So, you know, you still got to fear you're a human being, right? You must you must feel some, you obviously do feel fear. What scares you now? Do you have any? Uh yeah, I mean, I think, I think, again, fear is a broad, broad thing. I mean, when it comes to business, I, I balance my fear out with, with planning and, and, and thinking and persistence and knowing my destination because they can help you balance out fear, right? You need the three things. Just fear on its own isn't, isn't good enough, but I can, I can harness the power of fear by having a clear understanding of where I'm going, which is why I'm always talking about where I'm going right and i'm not talking you know that that's very important and then and then of course understanding i think um that, that fear is multiple levels like for example I, I i don't like roller coaster rides right i still have a feel going on roller coaster rides i don't particularly feel the need to overcome that fear right i don't and i don't think going on a roller coaster ride is necessary i have done it for the record but but i, I don't necessarily <laughs> overcoming that fear is particularly interesting so i just let that go right and i, I don't need to overcome that fear um, or, or embrace that type of fear that that to me is a different type of fear uh but for business 
I, I think the way I, I, my fear risk tolerance is much higher because I'm experienced. I understand how things work. I can, I always measure the downside. I always think what is the worst that can happen? So, you know, when you're asking me to come on a podcast show, first of all, I mean, I felt the same way as you when I invite people on my podcast show. So I totally right. understand. I have, I have empathy because I know what it's like when you're building something up, you want people to give you um, time and that ultimately should hopefully lead to a more successful product for you. A more successful product for you means that more people get that inspiration. More people get that inspiration means that more people potentially start a business of their own. So we all win, right? But I think, I think that a lot of the time with fear, um, I, I, I don't feel it, but unless, unless I don't have a clear idea of my destination or I don't feel like I can follow through. Okay. So, you know, health, for example, when you have health issues, and I've not had many touch wood, but I've had a few in my time. You know, when you have those things kicking, fear will overtake because I'm like, oh, I can't make that business work now because I'm sick today, mm. you know? So fear, fear is something to manage in that regard when your other two things I've mentioned aren't in balance. So then, you know, if I, if I can keep those three things in balance and I can, you know, I know my destination and I, and I can understand it and equally I can be persistent. In other words, I'm healthy enough to be persistent. Then I don't feel fear in a, in a bad way. Yeah, I love that. And so you've got to have that clear destination, persistence, um, and you've got to have, you know, got to have a risk tolerance. And you said around risk tolerance, you said, you said, you, you said you minimize the downside. And I, and I hear this a lot with entrepreneurs, you know, hear Tony Robbins talk about, you know, mitigating risk and everything like that. Take risk, but you minimize as much as you said. And Elon Musk even said that as long as you accept the consequences of your decision and you can live with that, then that's something you can accept and move on. What's your view on that? How do you, how do you minimize risk? And, you know, thinking about the business you built, you know, how got they successful? Was there a risk you took that you think actually that could have gone the other way? Or is there anything that, mm. that you go, you can try and get, almost like you're trying to give yourself a guarantee, but you know it's not a guarantee, but you can minimize those downsides. Is there any sort of tips you can give our audience around, you know, what you would say around that? Yeah, it's a complicated issue. Um, but, you know, I've had plenty of business failures. Okay. And, and I guess, you know, I, I pick one. I, I, I invested and worked quite hard on a comic book business called Devashard. And, um, you know, I, I, it's actually in my book. It's a, it's, a, it's a crazy story about building a comic book business out of Asia. Uh, you know, general theme was what if Superman landed in India? Or, or, or Batman was born in India or, you know, or China or you know, what, what would the world look like? What would, what would these superheroes look like? And we came up with our whole own superhero range around it. And, you know, I, um, I, I, I personally got quite stressed about this business and I lost right. a lot of money doing it. But I, I look back and what I realized is I absolutely loved the process. You know, I loved the people I met building that business. I loved the product that we actually produced, which I still have. Uh, today and, and I like holding it, you know. And the downside was I lost money. Now the beautiful thing about money is it's actually not a real thing. You know, it's the first virtual reality we kind of bought into. See, I meet a lot of people that say they, they're, they're smiling and drinking their coffee, and I, and they say they're happy because they've got a bit of money in the bank, right? But it's money in the bank. In other words, it's not real, but they're happy because it's there. So imagine that it's there, and then you can be happy. Is it that simple? Right? And if you take money away, I was, I was, I was already happy before I had money. Right. So downside is you lose money, right? The downside I'm not willing to ever kind of compromise is, you know, uh, for example, moral code, treating people well, being a decent human being. I'm not willing to compromise those things, right? I'm not willing to treat people badly. I'm not willing to, to do bad things. You know, and so for me, those are the downsides. Not, you know, so in other words, I, I could have done businesses in the past and be more successful with those businesses if I'd done something bad, right? But I'd rather lose the money. My downside is money. That's no problem. I don't mind losing money. I will not jeopardize my reputation or hurt people, right? So I love that. The only downside, I think, is, is important. What is your, what are you, I don't want to judge anyone, right? But I'm saying, you know, for me, downside is always money. That's okay. I'm, 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 I'll take a certain amount of money and I'll apply it to something. And that's what I do when I invest in something. And, and if I lose it, so be it. That's the worst that can happen. And if I've got no money five years from now, my wife will still love me if I'm a decent person, right? We've been together 20 years. You know, it's not about, 
right? My son will still love me if I don't have money, right? So as long as I'm there for him when he needs me and I treat him with respect, right? So the things that matter will still be there with or without money. So a lot of people look at downside as a money problem. I don't. I look at it as really more around, I would never want to um, take risk that would in any way jeopardize my reputation or, or that of the people or hurt the people that I care about. I love that. I absolutely love that. That's inspiring that. And, and I hear this message and, um, you know, you know, back in the day when I was, you know, you grow up, you know, you grow up through the system and stuff like that. And you hear about, you know, Gen X sort of people where just do as I say, and it's this whole thing about, I was going to, you know, there's that whole bit about just get what you want, you know, and now, I've, you know, it's so, they're so lovely, refreshing to hear this. And, and I think there is this massive wave of change. And I think you are that, that those, those people leading that charge. Like you've got Gary V doing this, you know, same thing that kindness is the, is the way, you know, um, and, uh, you know, treating people with respect and caring for people and having empathy. These are the big, gain you know these are the big these are the big game changes that help people connect with you the, the business and your mission and the purpose and that's what people want to that's why people want to you know connect with people because of the things they represent and i love that you would not have compromised that and that's that is so lovely um and i think simon sinek talks about you can get what you want as long as you don't stop others getting what they want and this whole thing about collaboration so you know simon i just love that and you think you know, you accept that actually, look, I lose the money, it's fine, as long as I'm a decent human being and I've got my morals intact, that's what it is. And, and it's lovely to hear that you've been so successful and this, and this stuff works and it's lovely and it's lovely to hear that. Like a force for good, and that's why I love that. And Nicole, talk about your force for good, actually, and, and the things you want to bring. And I'm, I want to sort of bring in this thing about libraries that you talked about as well. You want to save libraries. So I want to get this to our audience. So I can, I, the reason I connect with that story is because I've got... Um, a family member of mine who actually worked for the library service and they're shutting all that down. It's all, it's all being shut down. So do you want to tell us a bit about what you want to do with libraries? Because I think this is such a, a lovely thing that you, you want to try and do. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I, I just caveat that I'm, I'm not a perfect human being and, uh, you know, um, you'll be very kind to me, but I'm, I'm certainly not perfect and I, 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 I do make mistakes. Um, again, my book will talk about them. I've made a lot of mistakes. Um, and I think it's important to talk about those things that end up forming who you are. You've got to make mistakes, I think, to, to find out who you really are. But on the library front, I must admit, initially, libraries were not top of mind for me. I, I kind of viewed libraries as um, a facility that's there that I personally hardly use. And that, um, you know, as a, as a general rule, maybe it's, it's becoming an out of date concept. This is kind of the vague idea I had of, of libraries in my mind. And then um, I was walking past my local library near where I live uh, recently, and um, it, it is in disrespect, disrepair and closed up. And, and, I, and I, I, I don't know, something just kind of, I felt something uh, around the issue. And then I, I started digging a little bit about what was going on with the library and what had happened. And I started to, truly understand how important this library was to the most vulnerable in the community. You know, because a library is the only place you can go where, you know, they don't ask for money, the, you know, as soon as you walk through the door. It's one of the few places. I mean, you could argue um, there are other uh, things that don't, you know, as soon as you walk through the door, want money. But, but the library is one, I think, of that's not asking for anything from you. It's not asking you to have faith in any particular God, and it's not asking you to buy a coffee when you, when you walk in. It, it's literally there. And if you're a, a child who has no money, you can walk in there, see an expensive book, pledge that you'll bring it back and take it out. Um, and, and it just symbolizes something to me that kind of resonates with who I am today, you know, helping people with no catch, you know, trying to kind of, I want, I want that um, message. I think the library is kind of one of the original structures that does this to say that there are things out there that are free, that are good, that are useful, and that are helping people. And I think libraries are helping often the most vulnerable people get on Wi-Fi, for example. I mean, I've now spent time in the library since this first feeling, and I've watched people walk in there. And, you know, most of us take Wi-Fi for granted. There are people that can't afford the monthly cost that BT charge for Wi-Fi. And they, you know, they, they walk into that library and getting on the internet, that's the only way they can get onto the internet. In a modern society, that sounds insane, doesn't it? Yeah, that is a you know, And if they want somewhere to go that's not going to charge them four pounds for a coffee, they go to the library. 
right? And so, um, and I think, you know, it is um, one of those institutions that I, I don't want to get political, but I feel like, you know, one more thing the government doesn't fund because they don't see it as an electable um, thing to invest in. You know, if saving the banks will get them to, you know, get them re-elected, saving the library, no big deal, right? So they pull funding from the libraries. And as I dig deeper into what's happening, it is awful. And I think in this day and age, right now where we are, um, I do believe a society is judged by how it treats its most vulnerable and, and poorest amongst us. So to me, the library should be an institution, a system that should always be looked after and funded to support uh, people to get knowledge, to lift themselves up into uh, a better life. And so, you know, I, I just felt like, hold on, you know, the library resonates with my core belief that um, you should help people for free if we can, and that um, there should be this central knowledge bank that people can tap into, whether it's getting on Wi-Fi and connecting to the internet to get to the knowledge, yeah. or whether it's actually getting a book for free that's going to teach you about culture and about the world, that that should not be denied uh, to someone. So. So then I, you know, I started talking to the management and the library that um, I'm, I'm presently now uh, working with as a pilot is um, you know, run by a charity. And, and that's an interesting story on its own because wow. you know, libraries were, were once funded by the government and then due to austerity and the way the conservative government decided to operate, they cut the funding and then their idea was it was a, be a PR disaster to completely shut libraries under the conservative government management. So they outsourced a lot of the management of libraries to charities. And then those charities are literally like desperately asking people for money to keep the library open, right? And so libraries were in trouble prior to COVID. And then COVID literally, you know, pretty much put the nail in the coffin almost because, you know, no one's got spare money to keep a, a, a building uh, going that, that, that people can't even go to in theory. So, so I had an idea to reinvent the library. Um, and, and the idea is simple. Um, execution is a crazy issue, but I felt like the library's core essence is knowledge. And I feel like uh, what I'm trying to provide with my platform is knowledge. So I felt like more code we were aligned, you know, it's about helping. If you're unemployed and need help, we'll help you. If, if you've got a big company and you need help, we'll help you. You know, we're, we're not, library isn't, you know, um, income. It's not asking you, are you rich or poor? Okay, you're poor, you're allowed to be poor. Yeah, you're yeah. Allowed. Vice versa, right? It's not, there's no judgment. And I, so yeah. I felt aligned to that, that, like, to help people regardless. And then I felt aligned to this concept that, to me, a library is a knowledge bank. It's not about the books inside. It is about someone getting on Wi-Fi and getting access to knowledge or information yeah. or whatever they need. So I felt like I could plug in my system my knowledge share system that I'm building and built over the last year into the library ecosystem and make the library an entrepreneur hub. You know, for example, kids going to school, they don't learn about entrepreneurship. And I think entrepreneurship, a lot of it is about life, you know, managing your own money, managing cash flow, doing negotiations, doing deals, sales, marketing, brand. These things are all life experience things. It's not just business experience things. I love the idea that if you go to school and they don't teach you these things and they don't, you can come to the library after school and learn these things, right? And so what school isn't doing, the library will. I also feel like wow. there needs to be a competitor to job centers. I feel like job centers are, are invested in by the government, built to basically, you walk in there and they'll try and find you a job, right? Fine. But where's the facility for you to walk in and say, I don't want to work for someone else. I want to start something on my own. Can you help me? Love that. So it, to me, the library, my vision of the library for the future, and you know, it's not an easy thing to execute. I need help from the world to make this happen, the community to make this happen. But I believe you know, um, you, we can make that place a place, a competitor to the job center and a, and a competitor to school where we can give people knowledge, experience, real life um, insights, and, and give them the tools that these other institutions are not giving them and reinvent the library because ultimately that's all I'm doing. I'm, I'm saying that the library isn't about books, it's about knowledge. So let's provide knowledge plus books, right? And so that's it. I love that, I love that vision, competing with the job, 
the, the job centres. I love that. And you're absolutely right. You don't, that whole thing and school as well, you know, the life skills of school, you know, the, I th you sort of remind me of my, my school days, you know, when I went to school, I wasn't really engaged with school. I just didn't feel, I couldn't see the relevance of it, the application. So I think you're absolutely spot on with that. And that whole thing about knowledge, I love that whole vision. So, okay. So, you know, tell my audience what they need to do to support that. Is there anything they can do? What, what would you, what would you ask them? Yeah. Well, um, if anyone's interested in, um, being a mentor or being a coach or getting involved in supporting the, I guess the software of this new vision for libraries, then reach out. We're, we're looking for other entrepreneurs to support with things like office hours, which might be a zoom in, zoom out function, you might not have to necessarily sit in the library, but you know, anyone that wants to contribute from a, from a content perspective, reach out to us through purposefulproject.com or um, anyone that wants help to start a business, understand entrepreneurship, or would like their school kids, if you're a teacher to understand entrepreneurship, then reach out to us and we will try and provide that knowledge from our uh, library base um, to, to people. So, you know, it's kind of two sides of the marketplace, the, the people that want to help contribute to the mission and those that want to, you know, leverage the information that the, um, the, the system's offering. Absolutely love that. So, exactly, guys, if you you know if you want to get involved, you know, contact definitely contact someone, get in touch. Absolutely. Okay, so we're sort of nearly coming to the end, but I just wanted to sort of ask you a couple of a few a few things. Um, what's the legacy you want to leave behind, then, Simon? You know, so when we you know because we're all gonna you know, at the end of it, we are there is going to be end of life scenario. So, what sort of legacy do you want to leave behind in this on this on this lovely planet of ours or universe? I might say. It's, um, it's a very deep question um, and I think I've got a very simple answer. I mean, I, I probably just uh, want to leave a mark where my son is proud of me and is proud of what his dad has done and um, felt loved. You know, I think that I, mean, I, I, I could go bigger and say, you know, I'd love, I'd love to help a million people start a business of their own um, and hopefully we'll do that. Um, a lot of it is not in my control. You know, I can say I can take a horse to water, but I cannot make it drink. You know, I, 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 I will help. People. I don't know the outcome and hopefully I'll achieve that. But if I, if I, um, if I die and my, my son is looking at what I've done and, and proud and, and he felt love when I was here and feels love, then I will feel like I left a legacy. And hopefully that love will lead him on this probably butterfly effect either you know continue with my work and and fulfill my crazy dream or follow his own dream with love in his heart that's a wonderful that is a, such a nice legacy to leave and it's such a heartfelt one i can i can feel that you know because it's such a heartfelt message that's absolutely lovely and uh yeah i think it's fantastic and it's um a lovely thing to sort of think about a legacy and, and i say i think it's a really that was really warm and uh I don't want to say that. I just think it's lovely um, coming from you. It's, I think it's great. Um, so another thing I just saw to you, we, this is Inspiration Nation. So it's the last question really I'm going to ask you. Last question. What, and I know, and I think I'm going to know the answer. I don't know. I don't want to preempt it. So what's the sort of last sort of inspirational message you want to lead for our listeners? You know, what, what, what inspiration can you, can you give our audience, do you think, from your perspective, all your experience and what you've done? What could you leave us with? that would inspire us to sort of live our best lives and, and feel inspired? I'd probably say a few things. You know, Buddha once said, um, everyone will have 10,000 hours of good luck and 10,000 hours of bad luck. My addition to that would be, it's all a matter of perspective. So maybe, you know, the kind of optimistic, pessimistic view on the world, um, maybe take the optimistic. It's quite, um, it's much more enjoyable life. Um, I would probably also say, um, you know, be authentic, be yourself. You know, the whole like line you hear often, don't try to be someone else. It's already taken, you know, it's um, you know, just, just kind of try to be genuine, discover your purpose. If you do, you will have the most rewarding life. Um, and, you know, not that it needs to be said, I've said it a million times, money will not make you happy. You know, focus in on, you know, filling your own bucket first and don't, don't feel ashamed to do that. And then once your bucket's full and you know what your bucket's about, go out there and give people water. Maybe taking the analogy too far, but you know. Oh, just I like that. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've just 
I might have to trademark that. But you know, I love it. But I, I, ultimately, I, I, I would probably just tell people to try and live, you know, an authentic life, and you know, they'll be happier for it. And um, yeah, and, and try to figure out a way that you can you can contribute to making the world a better place. As cheesy as it sounds, it will leave you feeling happier. Yeah, I know. I definitely resonate with that. Definitely helping people does make you feel better. So it makes, makes you feel amazing. So, oh, thanks, Simon. I appreciate that. Okay, so Simon, it's really appreciate you. Thanks for coming on. I just want to sort of um, ask you now, where can people find you? How can they get involved with you? Like, you know, if they want to get in touch. Um, I know where to find you. I definitely know, but I want you to sort of share as many places as possible because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put these in the links as well in the videos we're going to release and stuff like that. But I just want to just, just let people know where to, to find you. Sure. Well, um, you can contact me directly through my own personal website, which is simonsquib.com. You can uh, listen to our uh, interviews with the world's most successful entrepreneurs on goodluckpod.com. Or you can reach out on our purposefulproject.com platform. And as I say, let us know how we can help you or equally how you feel you might be able to contribute to our mission in any way. Um, we, you know, we love to hear from from all sorts that feel like that either the mission is useful to them or that they can leverage what we're providing. So yeah, so th those three platforms are probably the easiest way to connect. That's fantastic. So guys, don't forget, go, go check out simonsquid.com. Go out there, go and, go and reach out. You know, support him. He's on social media all the time. He's got a fantastic TikTok account. It's brilliant. Um, you know, he's, got, he's on Instagram. He's fantastic. Actually, your TikTok stuff's really good you've got some really good ones the jack ma one made me laugh that was brilliant i loved it so i love the humor you put into it as well i think that's something i've got to work on the humor i struggle with that bit but you've got it just right i love it so thanks i appreciate it so you've been uh, you've been fantastic simon i appreciate it and uh, as i say um it's amazing i really do appreciate you and uh, thanks for coming on likewise thank you very much for having me thank you wow what a great conversation and the main things out of that are that luck is a skill and those three things are persistence, persisting in the thing that you want to do, continual persistence, keep going, keep going, keep going, eight years it took Simon. The second thing is risk, taking risks, leaning into the fear. If you take risk every day, you are going to have some form of success and leaning into the fear. Fear is an asset. And finally, your destination. You must have a clear destination of where you want to be. It's what's about intention, destination, a real clarity about where you're going. And there you have it. A fantastic way, fantastic value from Simon. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Simon. I'd love you checked out these videos over here, my previous interviews. I think you'll really enjoy them. So until next time, Inspiration Nation, and I'll see you there.